Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Park Community Church's live stream of our worship gathering this morning. My name is Steve Coble. I'm one of the teaching pastors here, and I am excited and delighted to open up the scriptures with you this morning. If you get a question about anything that I have to say or anything that came up during the worship gathering, there's going to be some information at the bottom of your screen that you can just text in in order to connect with us. And we'll take some questions, do some Q&A together uh, after the worship gathering. So if you would, we're continuing in our series uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter five. And this morning we're going to be in verse eight. So even if you have to Google it, go ahead and Google it. Matthew chapter five and verse eight. And when you've got it, do me a favor. I know I can't hear you, but it's good for my soul to know that somebody's out there shouting it. I got it. Matthew five and verse eight. Hear the words of our Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The very words of scripture. Amen. My wife will tell you that I love to go to places where I just don't belong, right? Uh, I love to see what all the fuss is about. I love to see what all the hype is about. Uh, Just what are the things that everybody says, this is the best that's out there. And such was the case one day when I found myself walking down Michigan Avenue and and I had just purchased Kristen's uh, diamond engagement ring. And I began to think to myself, uh, what kind of wedding band would I like to have? And Uh, And so I began to envision the different styles of wedding bands. And as I was making my way to Northwestern Hospital there on Michigan Avenue, I saw what I had heard was the creme de la creme of all jewelry stores. I, I saw that beautiful turquoise sign that read Tiffany and Co., uh, and so I, I said to myself, I've got some time to blow, and, uh, and so I better just go in here and see what all the fuss is about. And so I straightened my shirt. I, uh, I said to myself, you know, I, I bet they don't have too many brothers that just walk up into Tiffany and go and begin shopping for things. And so I prepare myself with the king's English, and I walk in past the security guard, and I said, will someone please show me the wedding bands, the male wedding bands? Uh, to which I was greeted by a salesperson named Nancy, and she thought I was tripping, and she took me over to the glass case where the uh, men's wedding bands were held, and she showed me uh, some that were in yellow gold and rose gold, and I said, Nancy, I I really prefer white gold. And she said, well, sir, you have to understand that we don't actually sell men's wedding bands in white gold. I said, oh, really? Really? She said, yes, sir, we only sell men's wedding bands in platinum. And I said, oh, oh, right, of course. Uh, Would you mind pulling out the platinum one for me? And uh, she pulls it out, and it's incredibly heavy, much heavier than the other rings that she had showed me. And I began to ask her, and she says, yes, platinum is one of the heaviest metals that's out there. It is it is probably the most uh, heavy, precious metal. And and so I I began to feel it in my hands. And I said, Nancy, I noticed something when I was looking around about this, this number 950 that goes along with uh, different precious metals. And she said, oh, Steve, yeah, that's that's actually the number that we measure based on the purity of that particular particular precious metal. And so that 950 was actually something that Tiffany's started way back when, so much so that it has become the standard for all jewelry stores all over the world. Our standard of purity for platinum is what they measure it by. As we get ready to come to our passage this morning, uh, Jesus is pointing out something uh, about the human heart. Uh, In other words, he's saying that he does not want just the platinum on the outside and, uh, and wood on the inside or a mixture of different materials. Otherwise, it wouldn't be considered pure. Essentially, what he says is, I want all of it. I want everything. I want your heart. I want your will. I want your emotions I want your mind. 
Because if there was a big idea to our passage this morning, it would be this. Purity requires everything. Purity requires everything. Before we get to our passage this morning, I want to give you a kind of table of contents uh, so that that can kind of shape the roadmap from where we are getting ready to head in our time this morning. Uh, The first thing that we're going to look at is how the Bible defines the heart. Uh, What what does it mean to have a pure heart? Uh, And and then secondly, we're going to look at what purity means according to Jesus. Uh, What does it mean to be pure and what exactly does that look like? And then third, we're going to look at what purity does not mean. We've created some different uh, perspectives on purity over the course of time, and uh, we're going to reorient ourselves to what Jesus calls purity. So we're going to look at what purity is not. And then fourth and finally, we're going to look at how we grow in purity. I want to preach from the subject, purity requires everything. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for even this opportunity to gather together in our homes and to hear your word proclaimed, to hear from heaven this morning. I pray that you would use me uh, in order to do that. Father, would you use me in spite of me? Would you uh, make much of Jesus in our time? And would you, your word be explained in our time together? It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. As we get ready to come to our text, Jesus is continuing what history calls the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, he's gone up this mountain and he begins to teach his disciples. And what follows is what history calls the very first portion of the Sermon on the Mount, which is the Beatitudes. And these Beatitudes are eight blessings that Jesus gives of those who are part of the kingdom of God. Uh, These are characteristics that make people candidates for the kingdom of God. The first four blessings specifically deal with the posture uh, that we have to have with God in order to be candidates for the kingdom. Uh, And then the first four, if you will, are a recognition of our spiritual poverty and our bankruptcy before God, Uh, genuine grieving for the condition of our hearts and the world around us, and a longing to be made right. Uh, Now, the next four focus on our position before others. So the first four focus on our posture before God. The next four focus on our character before others. And and we've been saying these these are characteristics of people who are a part of God's kingdom. They're not things we do to gain favor with God. These are things that we are. Blessed, Jesus says, are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Many biblical scholars, and hang in there with me, I promise I'm coming to your neighborhood. I'm going to pull up at the front door, and I'm going to come to the inside of your living room and hang out for a little while. But biblical scholars have noted the seemingly symmetrical nature of the Beatitudes. In other words, the first four correspond to God, and the next four correspond to one another or to each other. But there also seems to be a symmetry between each Beatitude attitude in the first four and each beatitude in the second four. So if we look at the second beatitude, it says, blessed are they who mourn. It lines up with our beatitude today, blessed are the pure in heart. So then the mourning of the second beatitude is because of or is over the lack of purity in our hearts. Let me say that one more time. The symmetry of our second beatitude with the beatitude that we have in front of us this morning uh, is that we are mourning over the lack of purity in our hearts. But what exactly does Jesus mean by the heart? Here's the first portion of our table of contents this morning. What exactly does Jesus mean by the heart? Biblically, the heart is something that represents the totality of a person. It is uh, a person's mind. It is uh, a person's will. It is a person's emotions. I I love what D. Martin Lloyd-Jones says uh, about those who are pure in heart. He says this. He says, blessed are those who are pure, not merely on the surface, 
but in the center of their being and at the source of every activity. That is, that is our hearts, the center of our being and the source of every activity. You see, at the center of the gospel is God's desire to not just have part of us, but to have all of us because purity requires everything. You see, that was why Jesus had that tremendous confrontation over and over and over again with the religious leaders of his time, because they love to keep rules and have the outside of their activity according to the way that other people saw them as beautiful and wonderful and righteous. And yet on the inside of their hearts, Jesus says, your hearts are full of dead men's bones. He says this in Matthew 23 and verse 27, and the words will come up on the screen. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. You see, the religious leaders wanted everything to look good on the outside, but their hearts were completely detached from uh, their outward obedience. And Jesus wants people to understand that integrity requires the whole person, or to say it how we've been saying it, purity requires everything. Jesus is not just concerned with the actions, but he's concerned with the motivations for the actions. That's why Jesus would say later on in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 28, he, he says these words, You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has committed adultery with her in his heart. He's saying disobedience to God doesn't just take place in what you do. It doesn't just take place in your actions. It begins in the central nervous system of who you are, your mind, your will, and your emotions. Uh, and here's something that we probably need to point out when it, comes, uh, when it comes to the heart. Many people think that Christianity is all about this mental ascent to a set of beliefs. Uh, and if you have these set of beliefs, then you don't have to engage every other part of who you are. And that simply isn't the case. God wants all of us. He wants our mind. He wants our will. He wants our emotions. He wants everything because purity requires everything. So what does it mean to be pure? What is Jesus talking about when it comes to purity? Now, the New Testament is originally written in a language called Greek, and here we move into the second portion of our table of contents. The New Testament is originally written in a language called Greek, and the Greek word used here for pure, when Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, uh, is the Greek word katharos, katharos. And, and it means to not be mixed with another substance. So just like our platinum illustration, there's a certain standard that a precious metal can be mixed with in order for it to still be considered Pure. And in essence, that's what purity means according to Jesus. It means to not be mixed with another substance. It carries with it this kind of single-mindedness of devotion to God. It is, it is an undivided love for God as our highest good, a, a devotion that has only loving God as its concern. The intentions and motivations of the centerpiece of who you are is focused on devotion to God. Uh, that, that is what it means to be pure. It, it means to have a one-track mind, and your one-track mind is to live in obedience to God. There is nothing else that you are mixed with, no other desire, no other intention, no other motivation other than having a one-track mind in living your life out for God. That is, that is what it means to be pure. And so uh, essentially the heart is the central nervous system of who we are, as we've said, our mind, will, and emotions. Uh, and purity is to have a one-track mind. And that one-track mind that's not mixed with any motivations or intentions other than serving and loving God. Now, parenthetically, 
Uh, As we move into the third portion of our table of contents, what purity is not, over the course of time, there have been different uh, teachings or different ideas that have come up uh, that have steered Christians away from the reality of what God is actually calling us to. And for many of us, it is a part of raising up our spiritual pride, and it is a part of being able to put our arms around trying to please God instead of actually giving him everything. And one of the ways that that showed up, some of my listeners, if you grew up in church and hang in there with me, I'm going to talk about this and I'm going to try to apply it to all of us. So regardless of whether or not you grew up in church or you did not grow up in church, I'm going to attempt to apply this to everybody. But for those of you who are children of the 1990s, you grew up in an age that in youth group and in Christian circles, people taught something that's known as the purity narrative, the the purity narrative. Uh, And this idea of the purity narrative, if I could be crass, if I could distill it down, is this concept and idea that if you save yourself from physical intimacy, and I know I got some children uh, who are listening to me right now, so you adults, if you save yourself from physical intimacy until you get married, Then on the other side of you getting married, God is going to bless you with Brad Pitt, who loves God and who serves Christ and who saved himself from physical intimacy, too. And God is going to give you uh, 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 Halle Berry on the other side, who loves God and who's never given herself to anything. And you guys on the other side of saving yourself from physical intimacy until you got married, you're going to have the greatest physical intimacy that anybody has ever had, right? That is, that is the, the purity narrative. If you save yourself, then on the other end of your obedience to God, God is going to give you something in return. And the interesting thing, Julie Slattery, who's a counselor around these particular topics who I was introduced to by Lisa Bishop, who's on staff here at our church, uh, the, the trauma from this purity narrative, this concept that has been taught, if you do these things, then God is going to give you these things. Uh, it, it has caused so much trauma that Julie Slattery literally won't use the word pure. She says integrity. So she's thrown out that word altogether because it carries so much negative connotation that's not in line with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this concept of I keep myself from these things, and then on the other side of this, I'm going to get something from God, has done a number of different things. On on one end, uh, it has created two classes of Christians, those who are pure and those who are not, so that those who have saved themselves from physical intimacy can say, hey, I I have some merit with God here. I have some reason to not be spiritually poor, right? And others who look at themselves with shame and despondency. It creates shame for those who have been sexually abused. It uh, it creates shame for those who uh, are same-sex attracted. It, It creates despair for those who are in their 30s and 40s and still single. You see, the line of thinking itself by nature has more in common with moralistic therapeutic deism than it does with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is not what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about being pure in heart. He says, yes, give me your relational intimacy. Let, let, Let me orient it to the way that I designed it for, but do those things not so that you can get something from me. Do those things so that you can experience the fullness of life and life to the full. Because the reality of your situation and my situation, that regardless of whether or not you saved yourself until you you got married to have uh, 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 physical intimacy with another person, It doesn't mean that you're not broken in some way. It doesn't mean that you're pure. 
The reality is, according to the first four Beatitudes and the rest of Scripture, is that none of us are. You're not pure. I'm not pure. We're all not pure. We're all in desperate need of grace. And that grace is only extended to those who recognize, I don't got any merit. I I, I don't have anything to present. I am hungering and thirsting for righteousness, and I don't have it in myself. And I don't have the ability to muster up the strength to perform it. You see, that's what purity is. That's what purity is not. It, it, is, it is not attempting in your own strength to present something to God and saying, hey, look at what I've done. Now you give me something back in response. If your pursuit of purity was just so you could earn merit with God or get that person and have all of that awesome physical intimacy on the other side of marriage, then the reality is, is you're not a candidate. You're not part of the people who live out the posture of their hearts in the first four Beatitudes. You're not a person who's poor in spirit. You see, because purity requires, it requires everything. And, and, and here's the problem. Here, here fundamentally is uh, is our issue as we, we move into what it looks like to grow in having a pure heart, a, a heart, our mind, will, and emotions, the central nervous system of who we are, and, uh, and having a pure heart, which means having a, a one-sided devotion, just a focused devotion to God in, in everything of who we are. Some of us may have created different rules for ourselves because we know it's just too hard to give God everything. We, we know the situation of our hearts. We'd rather create a rule rather than to think because it's too much to give them just, it's too much to give them all of everything that I am. I just want to give them my mind. So if I can just keep the rule on the outside and I keep, can keep the outside veneer looking good, then geez, it's got to be something. We, we, we recognize the difficulty that it is to give God everything. And so Oftentimes, we create for ourselves rules. And for that person who is listening to me, you didn't grow up in church and you you have no familiarity with the purity narrative, yet the reality of your situation and my situation and everybody's situation is that we want to present something to say, I belong. We create rules for ourselves just based on stuff that we created in our minds. And we compare and contrast ourselves to other people and say, hey, I'm doing better than they are. That's your situation and my situation and everybody's situation. That's us. And yet, what does it look like as we move to the fourth portion uh, of our table of contents? What does it look like to grow in being spiritually pure? Jeremiah 17.9 says this. It, it makes it even harder. And the words will come up on the screen. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? He, uh, Jeremiah here in the older portions of the scripture says, Our fundamental issue is that we don't have a pure heart. That's why we'd rather create a rule like the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' time, and be completely detached from it because our heart is messy. We, we never have a one-track mind. We are constantly filled with mixed motives and mixed desires. But the beauty of the gospel storyline is that Jesus Christ, the one who only had a pure heart, who lived the perfect life that you and I couldn't live, whose only desire, his one-track mind was set to please the Father, live like nobody else, died sacrificially in our place and for our sins and substitutionally and then rose in victory over Satan's sin and death so that the promise of Ezekiel 36 and 26 can be true in our lives. 
so that the only one who did actually have a pure heart could extend his pure heart to you and to me. Ezekiel 36 and verse 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And that's good news because it means that now we have the power to actually have a one-track mind of pleasing the Father. It means that now we don't have to be manipulators of information and situations so that the outcome uh, will fit our desires. We can actually have genuine intentions. And yet the reality of our situation is that we still wrestle with these mixed motives and these mixed intentions The same way that the Apostle Paul did in Romans chapter 7, verses 22 through 25, he says this. For in my inner being, in my heart, I want you to hear, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in my heart, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. But Steve, you said being pure means to have no mixture, to have a one-track mind. But, but even if we've become followers of Jesus, I still have this mixture going on in me according to Romans chapter 7. And maybe for some of us, that's the reason why we gave up a long time ago. Maybe for some of us, we're like, I can't keep all of this, but I'm going to keep this one. Maybe maybe for some of us, we said, you know what? This is too much. It's too much to handle. And guess what? You're right. It is too much for you to handle. And yet the beauty of the gospel is that God has given us his strength and his spirit and this new heart so that we can work in conjunction and participation with him. And we can rest assured of the promise from Jesus Christ that he who began that good work in you shall bring it to completion At the day of Christ Jesus, we are not passive in the process, so you don't have to give up. But what you do have to understand is that you cannot do it on your own. You cannot do it in your own strength. I I love what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13, and this is going to come up to you in the message version. He says, be energetic in your life of salvation, reverent and sensitive before God. That energy is God's energy, an energy deep within you. God himself willing and working at what will give him the most pleasure. Other translation says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And people just leave off the second half of that verse. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God in you who wills and works for his good pleasure. It is a participation in the energy that God has given you uh, through his power and his strength. It is, uh, it is what James 4 and 8 says, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The call is for you to put yourself in proximity to God and let him do the purifying of your heart, not in your own strength, but in his strength, not in your own might, but clinging to his, to his might. You see, the gospel storyline in your life and in mine is this one where we're in a process We're in a process where through his power and his strength, we get to say, I am spiritually bankrupt. God, I'm clinging to you for grace. I'm clinging to you for strength. And one of the things that we so often do is 
We look to different things to do to please God instead of realizing what we were saved for. We realize what we were saved from, but we forget what we were saved for. So we look at all types of things in order for God to be pleased and in order to grow in different ways. And yet the beauty of the gospel storyline is that God's call to you and me in order to create in us pure hearts is to pursue him in intimacy, is to pursue him in relationship. And as we pursue him in, in relationship, he changes our hearts. So let me ask you this question. Is there anything that you do for others that has made, uh, has more to do with other people thinking well of you as a good person than just because your single-minded desire to please God? Do you ever trust in your actions, the things that you do or things uh, that you don't do as the reason that God is pleased with you? Do you regularly consider your motives and intentions with decisions you've made in life? And to take that a step further, do you ever neglect to consider your motives and intentions when it comes to your evaluation of your own integrity? Yeah, me too. And yet hear David's words in Psalm 51 and 10. In relational intimacy, he comes to God. And he says to God, do something in my life. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. For many of us, We're stuck in the house. There's only so much we can do on a day-to-day basis. We're confronted now with the reality of not just our actions, but our motives. And maybe in light of this particular pandemic, God is saying, reorient yourself to pursue me so that the intentions and the motivations of your actions are solely based on just pleasing God. And not so that other people can say, hey, man, you're, you're a really incredible person. You're awesome. When I was in high school, I had a friend and teammate who I played baseball with. His dad was the first base coach for the Colorado Rockies. And uh, because he was the first base coach of the Colorado Rockies, we had distinct privileges when we were with him. We were able to experience stuff at the baseball field that we weren't able to experience if we weren't with him. And so uh, when we got to go to a couple of games, he would say, hey, you guys drive down with me because when you're with me, you'll get into the player parking lot and uh, you'll be able to get right into the stadium Uh, not because of uh, any special past that you have, but just because because you're with me. Uh, And then he he would invite us down to the player's locker room, and uh, we would go down there, and the guard would would look at us, but then he would look at my friend's dad, and uh, we would get in, not because of who we were, because we had a special past, but it was because we were with him. After that, they would take us down to the batting cage, and uh, we got to have conversations with all of these really cool uh, baseball players and watch them take batting practice. And and the reason why we we would get in that door to get to the batting cage is because we were with his dad. We were with him. And then we got out onto the field in pregame and got to throw the ball around on on the field, uh, not because of who we were, but because we were with him. Friend, hear the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You and I on this side of heaven will be wrestling with mixed motives without pure hearts. 
And yet the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that by faith in his pure heart, we can actually experience God. Or as the Lord says in Matthew 5 and 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Not because of who we are, but because of who he is. I love how Jesus ends this particular passage of Scripture. He says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In the older portions of the Bible, there is a man named Moses who was up in a mountain, and he asked to see God. And uh, and God says to this guy, Moses, he said, nobody can see my face and live. You don't understand. It would be too overwhelming for you to see my face. And so here's what God does for Moses. He places Moses uh, in the cleft of a rock, and he says, I'm going to pass by, and you're going to see my backside. That's all you can actually handle. So in, in essence, Moses gets placed in the cleft of the rock. God passes by. And by the time God is done, when Moses comes down from the mountain, his face is shining with the glory of God, just at seeing the backside of God. You see, God said to Moses, nobody can see my face and live because to see the face of God would be to see something so holy and so beautiful to see the source of everything that we ever found awesome in one moment and time. And that is going to be the incredible nature of us having placed our faith in Jesus Christ is that we will see God. Randy Alcorn in his book on heaven says this about seeing the face of God. He says, to see God's face is to behold his beauty, which is the source of all lesser beauties. To see God's face is to behold his beauty, which is the source of all lesser beauties. Every painting, every sunset, every incredible song, every beautiful voice, every uh, matchless landscape, every magnificent meal, every beautiful person, all of it, everything you ever thought was incredible and everything that ever took your breath away, you will see in one moment in time when you see the face of God. And it won't be because you are so pure. It'll be because he was. And by faith in Jesus Christ, we wrestle and we struggle with this new heart that he's given us, leaning into his power for his glory, seeking a pure heart, knowing that on the other end of it, he promises to ensure that we are pure. And it won't be because we made ourselves that way. It'll be because he made us that way and because we were with him. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we, man, there's so many things that are mixed in life. They, there's mixed motives and mixed intentions, and, and we confess that we just haven't had a one-track mind. Our, 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 our uh, hearts are constantly being pulled to different places, and yet, God, thank you that by your grace, you promised to complete the work that you started in us. And Father, we, we think of uh, all those other beatitudes and, and, uh, and what it means to actually have a pure heart and and, 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 and so in turn, it causes us to uh, care about mercy and it causes us to care about not just righteousness in us, but righteousness around us because you've created in us a new heart. You're purifying it. And so we care about the George Floyd situation and we care about the Ahmad Arbery situation and we are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, not just in us, but righteousness around us. And so, Father, today, would you help shape and mold us more and more into the image of the only one who ever truly had a pure heart? 
shape us into the mold, molding and image of, of Jesus Christ. It's in his name that I pray.